Hi, this is Joe. I'm reading part three of chapter two from Genesis Alpha. When last we left off, Josh was exploring Max's room, which had been torn apart by the police during exercising their search warrant. I'm on page 16 at the top. They've left his computer magazines in a mess on the bed, torn his movie posters down, pushed the furniture away from the walls, even cut his mattress open. His old computer is gone too, of course. Not that it makes a difference. It's four years old and probably wouldn't be fast enough for Genesis Alpha. I trudge back downstairs. There's nothing for me in my, in my room now that my computer's gone. Just to be sure, I check Dad's study. It's supposed to be Mom's office too, but she doesn't use it often. She says she prefers to leave work behind at the lab. Their two computers are gone too. My parents are still in the basement, together on the sofa their arms around each other. I keep my mouth shut about the mess upstairs and throw myself into an easy chair in the corner where mom used to read to me while I was little. Max would sit there when we watched TV on weekends, just the two of us. He'd sit in the chair and I'd lie on my floor in my pajamas. And if I started to doze off, he'd turn up the volume until I woke up again. How can they believe he did this? Mom whispers. She's staring at Max's picture hanging on the wall, his high school graduation picture. Max, our Max, how could they suspect him of something like this? It happened. Someone did it. Mom's hands push into her face, her knuckles burrowing into her eyes. Of course, someone did it. But we're talking about Max, Jack, our little boy. Do you know what that murderer did? How could anyone think Max could ever do something like that? They don't know him like we do. All they know is that someone did it. Someone's son. Someone's little boy. Not our son, Mom yells. Dad holds up a hand and she lowers her voice, but not by much. Monsters come from bad homes, from bad people. They're bad seeds. None of that applies to Max. How can they think that? We gave him a good home. We raised him well. He was always a good boy. Dad opens his mouth, and I hold my breath. Only breathe again when he closes his mouth without saying anything. Dad is notorious for always playing the devil's advocate, getting everybody riled up because they think he has strange views. He always has to see many sides of each story. This time, that's a bad thing. Of course, he says. Of course he's innocent. I just meant that they can't know. He shrugs. I mean, every family thinks their own is innocent. Well, he is. Max is innocent. A person who does something like this, it has to be a psychopath. Okay, let's just examine that. There are signs, aren't there? Mom is on her feet again, pacing. Of psychopaths, there are some things, signs in childhood. Yes, the triad. Bedwetting, setting fires, cruelty to animals. Max did wet the bed for a long time, but he was ill. That doesn't count. He never set fires. He used to play with fire. He loved to play with matches, remember? What child doesn't go through a phase like that? He never set fires without permission. Right. He never hurt animals. No, not that we know of. Mom breeds Abyssinian cats. We've had cats and kittens in the house as long as I can remember. There's always at least one in every room. Or maybe it just seems that way because they tend to follow us around, like they like company. Mom scoops Click from the floor, hugs him too tight. What do you mean, that we know of? Her voice rises hysterically. What do you mean, Jack? Nothing. I meant nothing. Dad exhales noisily. I'm sorry. I keep saying the wrong thing. Right now, I don't know what's wrong with me. Max loves the cats. Our very first cat was for him, remember? He'd wanted a pet for so long, and when he was in remission, healthy enough to enjoy it, we finally got him one. He loved that cat, remember? Remember how devastated he was when Moritz died? Dad nods. It'll be okay, Laura. You heard what they said. It's just circumstantial evidence. They have no real proof. All they need is someone to step forward with an alibi, and Max will be released. Even without that, they don't have enough to hold him for long. He'll be fine. 
Everything will be fine. Click has escaped from mom. He jumps into my lap, settles down there, and starts to purr. My parents keep talking, and most of the time they don't seem to notice I'm even there. They know I'm here. I'm not hiding, but they don't notice me. They try to include me in the conversation, pat me on the shoulder when they notice me, but then the attention drifts off me and back to Max. I think that's how it'll be until things are back to normal, until Max is back at college and the real killer is in police custody. Max has grown. He's locked inside his cell, but he's here too, filling every square inch of our minds. Mom's staring at another picture now, hanging beside the graduation photo. Max, when he was sick, just before I was born. He was dying. They didn't know if he could wait for the cure, if he could survive until I was born, but he hung on day by day. I gave mom a hard time for months. She felt weak and nauseated and tired. Sometimes she and Max would be throwing up together. She needed sleep, and she couldn't always stay with Max overnight, like she'd done so often before. But whenever she said goodbye to him and went home to bed, she was terrified she'd never see him again. He's white in the picture, as white as the bedclothes he's lying in. There's no hair on his head, and he's thin, so his face looks old. He's got big circles under his eyes, and he looks exhausted. Max hates that picture. Mom and Dad like having it around to remind themselves of the miracle, the miracle of Max's cure. They used to have it upstairs in the living room. Next to a picture of Max a year later, healthy. Um, page 20, I'm going to stop there, so it'll be one more segment.